Well, I knew I was going to deal with time because I knew nothing I could read would fit into the eight minutes I was allotted. <laughs> so, I didn't regret this guy who missed his plane at all. <laughs> I just got another four minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you about the title of the book and then I'm going to let you all decide which of two possibilities you, you want to hear. So The Rain Man's Third Cure comes from a verse in a Bob Dylan song called Stuck Inside of Mobile with the Memphis Blues Again. And the verse was, the rain man gave me two cures and he said jump right in. The one was Texas medicine and the other was railroad gin. And like a fool I mixed them and they strangled up my mind and now people just get uglier and I have no sense of time. <laughs> <clears throat> so for my purposes, Texas medicine was peyote, and I let it be a trope for the ecstatic, the collaborative, the counterculture, the world of love. And railroad gin is the goat juice of the robber barons, men and women who struggle for wealth and status and material goods and power. So I let it stand for the world of power. And then, somewhere late in life, I learned that there was a third option. So when I was young, I thought those were the only two choices. And the trick was to get the mix right. That <laughs> love without power is flaccid, and power without love is brutal and vicious. So, this book really is about various mentors that schooled me through the world of love and worlds of love and power. And then somewhere halfway along, I got introduced to the wisdom traditions. And at a certain point in the last chapter, I realized there was a third option other than love and power. But you have to read the book. To find out. <laughs> so I have two stories. One is about love and one is about power. And you can decide. One is, one is kind of funny. It's about uh, getting busted with eight kilos of marijuana. <laughs> when I was 17 in Mexico. And the other was about uh, an uncle who was a um, judge in, in mafia family disputes. So love her power. Love. 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 I by show of hands. Love. Love wins. What can you do? So I have to tell you just a second about the guy who is the mentor in this story before I actually start the story. So this is about a minute and a half of my 12 minutes. <clears throat> David Campbell was a dancer in Martha Graham's famous modern dance company uh, when he entered my parents' circle of friends. David was camp, mercurial, and outrageous. He threw off sparks. He and Buddy Jones became perfect resources for questions too sensitive to ask my parents. <laughs> David's outsider status as a gay man and an artist had sensitized him to the plight of other outsiders, blacks, artists, jazz folk, and hipsters. And his shimmering wit and personal authenticity granted him privileged admission across a wide spectrum of society. David appeared to know everyone from DuPonts, and I would later learn why, street hustlers and Harvard professors to Dizzy Gillespie. He fostered introductions and cross-pollinations between social sets as if he was a thread stitching disparate patches into a coherent quilt. For a while, my father secured an employment with John Walton and Sons, the antiques firm he bankrolled. David must have been quite an asset there because he breezed into the Englewood house one day threw me a signifying look over his shoulder as he sashayed past, informing me archly, a DuPont grabbed this ass today. <laughs> <coughs> so the summer I was 17, I was gonna take a road trip with my friend David Levine. We were gonna go out and see the beats in San Francisco. So that would have been uh, 1958. <clears throat> My parents were a bit uneasy about the pending summer trip and how far away and out of their control I would be, and you could double their concern for the Mexico portion. They relaxed when I promised them that in Mexico we would stay with David Campbell, who had moved to Manzanillo some years earlier, 
and now worked for the government arts agency teaching dance and Michael Chekhov acting set exercises in Indian villages. <laughs> this was a game that David must have invented. <laughs> Ruth and Morris appeared calmed by the fact that I would be under David's supervision. Under David's supervision is an oxymoron of such tension between its parts that I can only wonder, A, how the sentence can stand unsupported, and B, what were my parents thinking? To be in Mexico with David was to be stunned and overwhelmed on a daily basis. I was no longer a fly on the wall drinking in the distilled wisdom of elders, but a testosterone-fueled 17-year-old with a double-digit IQ and life experience, unfettered and unsupervised in the steaming, spawning, procreating, and rotting fertility of Mexico. Furthermore, I had a practiced libertine as a guide. David led us on a sleepless parade as if he were a pied piper of ecstasy. The three caballeros, David, I, and my buddy we nicknamed Little David to avoid confusion, caroused through bars, slapping piles of salt into our mouths from the backs of our hands, and before downing shots of tequila and biting tart wedges of lime. It takes a great deal of practice to accomplish that skillfully. We sang drunk in the streets, serenaded whores on their balconies, traipsed through brothels, ate tortillas de maíz, dripping carnitas, and pungent sauces of smoky chipotles cooked on the curb by vendors glazed with sweat. Life in Mexico for los gringos was cheap in 1958. There were 12 pesos to the dollar, and a peso in Mexico was worth something. In the mornings, we'd breakfast on fresh orange or melon juice, huevos rancheros covered with salsa so hot it made my nose run, accompanied by sides of fried red bananas. We chased breakfast with scalding coffee mixed with sweetened condensed milk. Everything smelled of limes, flour dust, diesel oil, rotting fruit, cheap pomade, jungle flowers, lard and seared cooking oil. The colors were improbably bright. Even the staid, ochre-colored Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception glowed in the light glancing off the sea. The name of that church passed over my lips like the invocation of a beat anthem. I was in Mexico, man, and I was uttering words and phrases that might have been written by Jack Kerouac, living in a free and exciting life far from the debilitating conflicts of home. I can't recall today how the subject surfaced, but one day we began to discuss marijuana. Perhaps David could not tolerate not being high, or with the refined instincts of a hustler, he might have concluded that some of little David and my travel money could be liberated to the end of altering his consciousness. <laughs> David's marijuana curriculum was very detailed and knowledgeable. He explained that marijuana was neither addictive nor harmful to the body, that it had been in use for centuries in the Middle East and Africa and in North and South America by Native Americans, blacks and Mexicans, with no harm done. Memories of Sue's story about her grandfather's rabbit tobacco came back to me then, confirming David's assertions. He explained how after Prohibition ended, federal and local police departments became desperate to retain the inflated budgets bestowed on them to enforce Prohibition. They joined forces with election-hungry politicians to create a new scourge that would justify extravagant and virtually endless flows of tax dollars which have continued to this day as the war on drugs. They identified marijuana as a new and previously unknown deadly threat to American sanity and racial purity, pushing tabloid stories of niggers, and that's exactly how the press stories were framed, raping white women under the influence of pot and cocaine. David's explanation was on a parallel track to other alternative explanations I had heard from Buddy Jones and Bohemians in Greenwich Village. I accepted them on faith. In the spirit of selfless scientific inquiry, <laughs> little David and I decided that we should determine the value of the experience for ourselves. We understood that weed was a staple of jazz and beat life, and so it appeared to be the next step on our Stations of the Cross pilgrimage from suburban marshmallows to initiated hipsters. <laughs> 
Big David scored some weed that day and rolled a joint as I drove around the countryside at dusk. Sucking down the smoke, holding my breath, coughing it up, hacking and wheezing, wiping the tears from my eyes with my forearms, I noticed no difference between pre- and post-inhale reality. Big David surmised that we had not had enough. So he rolled and we smoked another blunt, and we smoked out a third as well. Somewhere during the third joint, as I was wondering what all the fuss was about, I spooked, shrieked, jerked the wheel to avoid a phantom dog in my headlights. The car lurched off the road, bouncing across the sand ruts and through the mesquite and sage, with the three of us laughing and weeping like crazy people. I was high. Boy, it was fun. Our first experiment was a complete success, but intellectual rigor demanded practice if little David and I were to become thoroughly knowledgeable. <clears throat> We returned to the subject multiple times a day, smoking ourselves into red-eyed, cotton-mouthed, sugar-sucking delirium. Under the influence of the sticky, pollen-rich leaves, Mexico was transformed. Oil sheen rainbows glowed on shimmering quicksilver puddles. The interlocking patterns of a weechel's shirt signaled deep wisdom just beyond the grasp of language's greedy fingers. The glistening piles of habanero, ancho, and pasilla chilis stacked in the market stalls glowed with inner fire, and the faces passing in the street might have been Aztecs or Mayans in possession of ancient mysteries. Mexico's imponderables were far more interesting than the vexing word problems in my school math book, demanding to know when trains A and B leaving different stations at different speeds would intersect. Absent my father's prosecutorial inquisitions, I was free to express my real feelings on the subject. Uh, which was, who gives a fuck? <laughs> Finally, I knew in my innermost being how jazz men felt, how a sound, a smell, a phrase could trigger cascading associations and release creative responses which bypassed thought. Singing, repeating random phrases and associations, or dancing in place if I felt like it. Weed exposed and cracked codes from a parallel world that I had received intimations of. But now, the final keystone had been dropped in place, and the high and open arch of my mind was freestanding and self-supporting. If I had stopped there, everything might have been all right. <laughs> you laugh. <laughs> As time approached for us to leave Mexico, I had become thoroughly convinced that marijuana was a healthier, saner social lubricant than alcohol. I resolved to bring some home, rescue my friends from growing up like our parents, and claim my due measure of notoriety as Johnny Weed Seed. Because I had no idea if I might ever return to Mexico, I thought it prudent to lay in an ample supply. <laughs> Big David made some inquiries and we took an evening's drive 10 or 15 miles outside of Mazatlan, following a simple map his informant had scrawled on a brown paper bag. We ended up traversing a long, sandy wash that only an optimist could consider a road. Creatures skittered into and out of the penumbra of the headlights, starkly illuminated one moment, and the next absorbed by darkness like a funhouse ride. Owls cried among the darkening silhouettes of Ocotillo cactus, and the dense brush along the edges of the sandy track obscured what lay beyond in this gathering dark. The journey ended at an impoverished structure of odd-sized, obviously salvaged, multicolored boards topped by a low, flat roof. Several blue tin kerosene lamps from highway construction sites dangled from the porch beams, beams, their pallid glow claiming a meager radius of only several feet against the night. A chicken clucked pacifically in the yard, pecking around a dog which lay on the porch who leveled a hoarse croak in our direction without deigning to rise. Big David dickered in Spanish with a young campesino in filthy white pants and shirt, settling on a $60, 720 peso price 
which little David and I stepped aside to count carefully in the headlights. For this modest amount of money, we received eight kilos, more than 16 pounds of uncleaned marijuana trailing over the edges of a coarsely woven bushel basket, which we shoehorned into the back seat of the car and covered with a serape. The three of us passed the next two days locked in a motel room with the blinds drawn and towels stuffed around the bottom edge of the door, smoking ourselves into a numb nut stupor. Under Big David's tutelage, we stripped the leaves from the woody stems, bundled them into packages, roughly half the size of New York phone books. We wrapped them tightly in newspaper and plastic bags and sealed them with sticky tape. For all our shrewd and considered precautions, had police been looking for us, they could have discerned the scent trail leaking out of our room from a block away. <laughs> we certainly could when we returned from meals, a fact we found hysterically funny. <laughs> Failing that, the police could have chosen the motel room whose window screen was virtually blacked out by 9,000 narcotized houseflies. <laughs> Wow, mom, just like professional smugglers. Who could possibly be better at this than two whacked out teenagers and their stoned gay accomplice? After helping us secure the bricks in the closed well under the rear seat of my car, simple, pull up seat, throw in weed, drop seat. Fiendishly clever. The plan required only three stoned people to accomplish. Once all was ready and departure day loomed, Big, Big David sat us down for detailed Chekhovian instructions designed to help us cross the border safely. It's important to be innocent, he said seriously. <laughs> Acting is not pretending. If you pretend, people will see you pretending. You must find something that you actually believe. Search your imagination. You're carrying medicine for your friends. Make them specific. Who? What is their illness? You have to believe it, and then you'll be bulletproof. <laughs> you will leak no guilt. This conversation was invaluable to me 20 years later when I became a professional actor. <laughs> to judge by what transpired, however, either David's lesson did not penetrate too deeply, or his knowledge of smuggling equaled his knowledge of vaginas. <laughs> Big David waved us bravely off his tiny figure diminishing in the rearview mirror, clutching the generous bundle of weed we had left him as a thank you. My last vision of him for 50 years was his slender body dressed in a bold Hawaiian shirt and sarong, assuming clownish Martha Graham dance postures against the background of the wild jungle behind him. Little David and I smoked our way through the multi-day journey north to the water to the border. I had chosen to wear a tie for the crossing. <laughs> Disguising myself as an innocent young man returning from a summer's jaunt. Think Newport. In my own mind, I was bearing life-saving medicine for imperiled friends who might die without it. I even considered turning on my parents to wean them from alcohol. That was a worthy purpose. I did not harbor the slightest shadow of self-doubt as we entered the line of idling cars waiting to pass through customs at Matamoros. Leaving the Mexican side with little more than a wave, we pulled into the long line of stalled traffic oozing toward the international border of the United States, manned by heavily armed and unnervingly alert officials of the U.S. Customs Service. The first shadow dulling the glare of my sunny confidence <laughs> occurred when our car was signaled out of line by two unsmiling fellows in uniform and identical aviator sunglasses. 
We were directed to an isolated area under a tin roof where we were greeted by unsmiling, more unsmiling officers carrying flashlights the lengths of police batons. They asked us to step outside. <laughs> they surrounded our car and began combing through our stuff with the concentration of a mother searching her child's hair for knits. <laughs> when they began unrolling the balls of newspaper stuffed into a pair of new boots I bought in the Mazatlan Mercado, an insistent, queasy flutter in my stomach began pulsing like a tick. Moments later, an agent flipped my driver's seat forward, bent into the rear of the car, jerked up the back seat, and demanded to know what was in those taped bundles lying, <laughs> glowing from my point of view, in the seat well. How could he have known? I became lightheaded and disoriented. My confidence evaporated. I was instantly his prey. What packages I was handed stupidly. I don't know, I muttered. They seized us roughly by the shoulders and frog marched us toward the border station, which I remember is a squat cinder block affair with op opaque windows and bright aluminum trim. Lightheaded, off balance, and dazed, imagining the consequences that lay ahead, I staggered as my captor jerked me along. When he splashed me through a deep puddle, I was still so high that I protested, turning to him indignantly and exclaimed, Easy, man, I'm not a criminal. <laughs> the agent laughed like he was barking, shook his head incredulously, and released his grip. Instead of pulling me, he now propelled me with repeated shoves. All my research about bohemian life, about political resistance, about being an artist in this moment amounted to being informed that I had a terminal disease. A series of interviews with stern interrogators followed and queries on the order of, suppose someone gave this stuff to your sister, followed. In some residual reservoir of wisdom, I decided to check my impulse to respond, my sister would love it. <laughs> or I might still be in Texas. <laughs> Little David and I spent 10 stultifying, boring days as the only prisoners in a spacious cinder block drunk tank in Brownsville, Texas. Our twin bunk beds had no mattresses, only wire mesh supports, which transferred their grid patterns into your flesh after 10 minutes of lying on them. It required the 10 days for me to summon the courage to call my father. During the first mind-numbing days in the overheated green and gray concrete room, it became apparent that we were not going to be released after a good scare or some other fervently wished for pipe dream. David's mother was a single woman and realizing that our only source of aid would be my father, I began rehearsing opening gambits for the conversation I knew I would have to have with him. God, Dad, someone must have hidden drugs in our car. And then... Hey, Dad, I've got kind of a problem here. We left the car unlocked one night and went camping. And... Dad, I have good news and I have bad news. Actually, I don't have any good news at all, except that we're alive. I do have a little bad news. Morris confounded my every expectation as if he had planned his response to keep me off balance by normally bending, bruising, and stretching to the breaking point whatever love I had for him, and then suddenly reversing himself in some remarkable manner. Contrary to my gut-cramping fears, he behaved impeccably. He did not, on the phone or ever afterwards, not once, ever mention my stupidity, lecture or judge me. He sheltered me under the umbrella of his power, moving his knights and pawns to protect David and I, and assuming all of David's legal bills as a man of power could. I was completely at his mercy, and for the first time, perhaps because I had no other option, I could clearly observe how his power was now focused solely on my benefit. I was simultaneously mortified and gratified, and once again, in the palm of Morris's hand, which was at this time mercifully open. So I could read you about the trial. It's about three more minutes, or maybe that's it. Is that okay? All right. 
So Dad's partner in the Charolais cattle business was a tall, slender, hickory peg of a Texan named Harl Thomas from a nearby town called Harlingen, close to Brownsville, where we were being held. According to Morris, Harl was a member of the hundred family oligarchy that still rules Texas. Like Bostonian and Philadelphian aristocrats, these voluble and easygoing Southerners keep track of their lineage and pedigree to the same exacting degree as their Northwest Brahmin peers, but do so with a Southern lilt of the, oh yes, his mama was a bass out of Corpus, and she married a playbird, bless her heart. <laughs> Considering their power, Morris once observed to me, they're never audited by the IRS, and their children are never drafted in the Army. Harl had married a Mexican woman of fabulous wealth, whose family reputedly owned a million acres in Mexico, including 35 miles of pristine beachfront flanked on either boundary by tourist kitsch and sovaco barrios, armpit neighborhoods, whose development screeched to a halt at our property lines. Power and wealth of that order ensured us bail, and we were flown home to await trial. Six months later, Morris, David, and I returned to Texas for sentencing. I was very apprehensive, and so was Morris, perhaps even more so because he understood more fully than I did what the consequences could be. We're going to Texas, one of the most reactionary law and order states in the Union, even today routinely executing over 200 people a year. It's legal to drink, drive, and carry a pistol in your car there. It was clear to me that I could be going to jail for a very long time. We we're facing sentencing in the same state and year where shortly before us, a stripper and porn star named Juanita Dale Slusher, AKA Candy Bar, had recently been sentenced to 15 years for possessing four fifths of an ounce of weed. We had 16 pounds. <laughs> Suggesting that I was nervous would be like comparing hiccups to grand mal seizures. <laughs> I was 17, how would I survive in that tooth and claw prison environment with no Morris or Harry Palmer protecting my back? What had I been thinking? Oh, that's right, I wasn't thinking, I was stoned. <laughs> we were represented in court by Harl Thomas's personal attorney, a polished old warhorse whose curious name was Ransom Crook. <laughs> you can't make that shit up. I'd have liked to have queried his parents as to what they were thinking on the night they named their child. As the hearing began, I was cotton-mouthed. Morris sat just behind me, rigid as a Texas phone pole. Ransom, dressed in a chocolate brown suit, unfurled himself from his chair and rose to his full height of well over six feet. On hearing his first utterance, I had a sudden intimation that we were in extremely competent hands. Projected in a gravelly and confident voice, he gargled some turgid sentiment like, Your Honor, these are good boys. <laughs> Wrong there, Ransom. I saw my father visibly relax as the judge chortled, shook his head incredulously, and settled in for an entertaining morning. Apparently, all the players, save for little David and me, knew that the outcome had been predetermined. By the time that uh, the ransom was done, David and I, due to our being 17, had been adjudged delinquent and not felons. When we turned 21, our crimes would be expunged, our records sealed, and returned to us. Not true. 55 years later, I applied to get through the passport thing at the airport really quickly. I was turned down. <laughs> Anyway, uh, the judge sentenced us to probation until our majority ordered us to go home and go to school, which at that moment appeared luminous and attractive, and, and, and keep your noses clean, which technically I did. <laughs> However, he failed to specify for how long. <laughs> it's just, thank you. There's just one little caveat. So when I turned 21, I got my, my records back and I got my mug shots. And you remember the part about, about the tie? Yeah, well I was wearing a tie, but I was wearing a Greek fisherman shirt. And the tie was simply knotted around my arms. 
I was not cut out for life. <laughs> Thank you all very much.